and I and our colleagues at CGGC, which we had a lot more practice in saying that Gavin has it, is this sometimes not trip off the tongue as light, nicely as we'd like. Um, but uh, again, we appreciate the invitation to come here and talk about ourselves. We believe in some ways that our center is one of the better kept secrets at Duke. Um, I, I think one of the instincts in the academy is that we tend to be rather self-important and we're doing work for our clients and for ourselves and we think the, the value of that work is self-evident and those who care about it should find us. Uh, we know that that's not always the case. And uh, we're on something of a mission and we're grateful to our colleagues here at the Global Health Institute for extending this invitation so that we can, can spread the word, be somewhat missionaries for GBC, shall we say, among our colleagues and other academic units at Duke. So we're here to talk about global value chain analysis and global health. The meat of the presentation will be on Dane, who's been working and supervising and participating in research projects specifically dealing with global health at Duke. But I just wanted to give you a bit of background on who we are and what we do and where we're situated and so forth. So, there we go. So we'll talk about what is the center, what is GVC analysis, and how is this framework useful for researching questions in the area of global health. So what is the Duke CGC? Well, basically, we we should always begin with who we are, who are the people. We were founded by Gary Jareffi in 2004. Gary is a professor of sociology here at Duke, been here since 1980, so he's one of the longer term senior faculty members at, at Duke. Gary and a group of people around the world, uh, starting in the 80s and through the 90s and into the 2000s, was the founding uh, author of a framework, this global value chain analysis framework that we'll be talking about. Uh, Gary continues to be a lightning rod for uh, global organizations who are interested in what this framework can do for them and helping them answer questions that matter to them. The other pictures in this series here, they pick, for example, in the upper right, Gary and I were just recently in Kazakhstan. Uh, our center has a cooperating agreement with a unit of the government of Kazakhstan to help train researchers to basically do what it is that we do. So we were there in Astana last week. It was only 20 degrees. In November last year, it was 20 below zero in Kazakhstan. If you've ever been there, it can be a very cold place, but warm on the inside. Um, so we are about nine researchers altogether. Dane is one of them. Two of our researchers live and work out of their office in Santiago, Chile. We are working in, an, in a virtual environment after all, so it matters not basically where you're sitting. Everyone knows who they're responsible to and who they're responsible for, basically the client. Uh, and, and their colleagues, and we just, through WebEx and Skype and all other kinds of virtual communication means, we're ma we maintain contact with one another and keep things flowing forward. So what we do is do work largely under contract. So we're something of a CRO existing within an academic institution. We feel like we bring the best of both worlds to that particular uh, dilemma, if you want to call it a dilemma. That, so we're doing work under contract. That's basically how we get paid. Duke is very kind to us in giving us a place to work and situating us within a, an institution that has tremendous credibility and presence in the world. And then we get busy working with clients who may be interested in what we do for them. So defining a question and then taking our expertise and our experience and particularly the use of this framework, which Dane will talk about more in a moment, to help answer their questions and hopefully lead to solutions. So we don't focus as much on publications as perhaps we would like because you can imagine that our clients, which I'll put up on the screen in a moment, the kind of clients we work with, they're not necessarily interested in that academic deliverable as, as you and I might be. We know that's important for us to contribute to the literature and to continue the conversation among our academic colleagues. But our clients, be they the World Bank or USAID or the Inter-American Development Bank or the Kauffman Foundation or the World Economic Forum, the Bank of America, the Walton Family Foundation, whoever they may be, this is just a sampling of people we've had the privilege to work with over the years. We work with them initially. Normally, I will be honest with you, we're very fortunate they approach us. So we don't, we're not driven as much as perhaps we should be to participate in RFPs and, and to compete for what it is that, uh, that, that we're being asked to do. Normally they come to us and it's up to us to work with them to find that terms of reference, that frame of reference, that scope of work that meets their needs while basically fitting it within our time, scheme, time, time frame and our budget. So we've been lucky to, to work with all these clients. Many of them we continue to work with today. Uh, ongoing projects at the center include this project in Kazakhstan, which is a three-year project. We're in the third year of this three-year project to do 
capacity building and research and visibility and network creation for this unit of the government of Kazakhstan. We're working with USAID and RTI International on the second phase of a two-phase project in the Philippines, working on multiple industries. We're working with the Organization of American States, uh, OAS, based in Washington, uh, on a two-year project essentially to build capacity for doing research on economic development in uh, various Caribbean nations. And uh, we're finishing a, a four-year project with the Minerva Initiative of the Department of Defense that Dane's been involved with, together with his colleague, Ad Ahmed, uh, working on food security. Um, and we're working, we just had a conversation this morning with Oxfam America. We've had a number of projects with Oxfam over the years, helping to use our framework to help them answer questions of global inequality. In this case, we're looking at food systems and global inequality, and that's the beginning of what we think is going to be probably a three to five year engagement with them. And lastly, we're very excited. Uh, we've been in conversation with the International Trade Center in Geneva, which is a UN agency uh, who is also beginning to look at the work that we've done Gratefully, the work that we've done tends to kind of put up the Batman's sign and people are kind of drawn to it. Um, and so the ITC in Geneva, we've just finished an MOU with the ITC. This is alphabet soup here today. Um, an MOU with the ITC to talk about GBC. Do you follow me there? Uh, so we're looking forward. And that, once again, is going to be largely on questions around ag agriculture and the role of food in the ecosystem uh, of economic development. I said lastly already, I'm going to say lastly again, we're in regular conversation with the Sanford School of Public Policy and Dean Kelly Brownell and his new World Food Policy Center to find ways in which we can work with them as well. We feel that we have some experience and some expertise and some perspective on some of these food issues that will be helpful to the World Food Policy Center in the future. And more importantly, we're here today to speak with you because we've had ongoing conversations in, uh, with the Global Health Institute for nearly eight years in finding ways, that finding that neat intersection of interest and capability um, to, again, to bring our expertise, expertise and experience to bear on questions of global health. So we hope to kind of make that case to you here today. What we're hoping to get out of this, this, this uh, gathering today is just increased awareness on your part of who we are and what we do, and we're hoping to find, again, that sweet spot of intersection of interest and capability <laughs> that will be of interest to you and research teams here at, at DGHI that can lead to some cooperative programs and project development in the future. So with that, I'll pass it on to Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. So, thank you all for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here to speak. Um, it was, I was introduced as both Danny and Dane. Dane is a nickname. I go by both, so feel free to call me whichever. And yes, I am one in the same, at least last time I checked. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is give you a brief elevator speech overview of what is global value chain analysis, and what do we mean when we say GVCs, and how does it relate to questions of development, and then talk a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing applying it to questions of global health with Jeffrey Moe, who is a faculty member here at DGHI. Um, so global value chain analysis emerged in the 1990s and early 2000s as a way of studying the global economy. Um, originally, it looked at questions of international economic development and trying to figure out who were the lead firms and how did countries and regions integrate and interact with lead firms and the globe in general to maximize returns. Um, so there are two key components to this. First, we take a top-down approach where we look at the global economy as a whole, try to identify who are the lead actors and how do they link into one another, what are the interactor networks, to identify what we call governance. And a very easy way to think of that is what are the rules of the game and who gets to set them. Then we also take a bottom-up perspective. So we pick a specific country or sub-region of the world and look at the various trajectories that they can take and policy and other interventions that they can take to increase the likelihood of economic or social upgrading or downgrading, so get the desired outcome or not. Um, increasingly, the recent work in global value chains is continuing to do economic development, but also looking at other aspects of globalization social, food security, nutrition, um, global health, and then also environmental, looking at sustainability. So when we talk about global value chains, one of the things that we always have is a map. So I will show a more detailed map in a second, but we always map an industry. So this is a very preliminary rough sketch of work that I'm currently doing as part of a vast connection with Nimi Ramanujan, um, looking at 
in the introduction of new cervical cancer screening in Peru. So you have a set of inputs, production, distribution, marketing, and hopefully eventually adoption. Um, the first thing you do is to trace the geographic spread of production and distribution, or also in this case, we're looking at global incidences of cervical cancer. Um, then you map the ecosystem of actors, who's involved in the discussion and what ways are they involved and how do they link to one another. Then looking at their, the stakeholder analysis of firms and organizations. So once you know who it's there, you look at what matters to them, what can they do, what can they not do, what are their capabilities, and what are their interests. Um, then building on that, you can identify these global governance structures and country governance structures and enabling environments. So what are the rules of the game? And so eventually you can identify the upgrading trajectories or leverage points. So leverage points, when I refer to that, is specific parts along the chain where specific action or inaction can determine the outcome. Um, so I will show an example of that in a second. So here is a more detailed GVC map. This is from work that two CDGC work, or a team of CDGC workers led by Penny Bomber, um, Gary Durofi, our director, and Karina Stark did, looking at the medical devices in Costa Rica. The Costa Rican government was interested in increasing their competitiveness in developing these devices. And so this sort of shows a quick snapshot of where they're involved, where their firms are doing things. Most were active in component manufacturing, but this gives an idea of what a GVC map would look like. Um, then we can add on that by layering in what are firms' capacities. So once we figure out who are the firms that are active in a specific value chain, where are they active? What are they doing? So this is from a study looking at coastal restoration um, in the United States to see who are the firms that were involved and what were they doing um, across to give a quick snapshot of stakeholder activities. Um, so how do we take these things to look at issues of global health? So what I'm going to talk about now is from the research that Jeffrey Moe and I conducted with the BAST team in Bangladesh to look at chlorhexidine adaptation and use. Um, so after over a decade of research and multiple inputs from multiple partners, the Bangladeshi government has decided to now, instead of advocating for dry care and umbilical, or umbilical cord care, to advocate for chlorhexidine to be used to treat it to prevent um, infection. So we went and with a team of about 10 students, we mapped what the chlorhexidine value chain would look like. So you have a set of inputs that are important um, from research and development to machines to labor that feed into production and packaging. So you have production which revolves around mixing different um, APIs, certification, quality control, and then the different packaging which has actually become really important in chlorhexidine. Um, and then it moves into three main distribution channels. You have a government distribution, a private distribution, and then an NGO-led one that feeds into different marketing places from pharmacies to healthcare facilities to safe birth kits, and finally reach a set, set of end users. So that's pretty standard. But supporting all of this is a group of multinational corporations and international organizations that are providing consultation as well as helping to facilitate trade. Um, and all of these other supporting activities and institutions from financing to building training and awareness to monitoring and performance metrics. So in our study, when we were looking at leverage points, so what are the things that oftentimes make or break the success of an intervention? We identified a subset, which is highlighted in green, of seven different leverage points. And today I'm going to talk about two in particular, production and informal health care providers. So production, a little bit of backstory. When the government decided that they were going to move from dry cord care to using chlorhexidine, they approached four different in-country manufacturers because at the same time, it was important for them to facilitate economic, or stimulate economic development within Bangladesh. So they approached four. When it came time to submit bids to produce for the government demand, which was the primary driver at the time, only one company decided to do it. And that's important for a bunch of reasons. First of all, if that company decides to no longer produce chlorhexidine, if their production facilities go down for some reason, then all of a sudden it creates a critical shortage in supply. And at the, and at the beginning, the government's going to be the major distributor of chlorhexidine. The second thing is that then all of a sudden they have a monopoly of, of the market and the cost, the risk for the cost associated to the public becomes difficult to manage. And then the third thing that we found, and this was interesting, if you go one step back in the value chain, the company that submitted the bid and won it only had one supplier 
for their bottling, which is important and also in the case of purchasing the most expensive part. So if anything happened, they were linked completely to one supplier in India for the bottles um, and the caps. So we looked at how, we're, and the report, and we talked about this, is the need for stimulating other types of innovations, whether it be promoting alternative packaging or trying to diversify and get other actors and country involved, or opening it up potentially to international companies to bid as well. Um, one of the reasons that we found that the firms were not willing to come in or were hesitant to bid was because of the money. It was very difficult to make a profit on chlorhexidine, especially in just one country. So it would be better to pull them, pull demand from a regional regional block of countries. The second leverage point I'm going to talk about is informal healthcare workers. What we uncovered when we were in the field is that there was a very interesting dynamic going on where the government or births in Bangladesh were largely overseen over 60% by informal healthcare workers who were not formally trained. The government had recently established a new mandate or a new um, drive to bring more people into clinics to formalize healthcare more. So there was an at odds between distributing chlorhexidine to informal healthcare workers or and their drive of trying to bring people in. So when this happened, automatically you were at risk of getting 68% of workers, or 68% of births um, were not going to be included with the chlorhexidine distribution unless you were able to get other channels outside of the government, including the NGO network or the um, private sector. When we went and talked to major NGOs in the country, BRAC for example, what we learned is that they were very much aware of the chlorhexidine push. They were very interested in getting chlorhexidine and adding it to the birth kits that they distribute to informal healthcare workers in various parts of Bangladesh. But they had a problem, and the problem went right back to the previous slide. They didn't like that there was only one supplier. They felt like that was not necessarily the, getting people the best price, and they were concerned that it would create a scenario where the price of chlorhexidine would create such a high cost that the entire bundle of goods that BRAC would distribute as the main NGO would be um, out of the reach for most of the people that they serve. So they chose to no longer to say that they supported it, but not to formally add chlorhexidine into their bundle until they could talk and try to see if they could create more competition in the market. So through this research, we saw how a bunch of different economic and business practices really impacted and created very critical leverage points for the value chain in chlorhexidine. Um, because we wanted to open it up for discussion, I went through this very quickly. If you're interested, this report is available for free download at the, at the CGGC website, cggc.duke.edu. Um, and if you have any questions that we can't answer today, feel free to email my co-author, Jeffrey Moe, or myself. Um, so thank you guys very much. And at this time, I guess we can open it up for a general discussion. Questions, comments, concerns, hopes, dreams, or fears? Yes, Ipshita. Hi, my name is Ipshita Parali. So I work with Dr. Gavin Yami on the new Center for Policy Impact. And you had mentioned Oxfam. I actually worked with Oxfam over the summer, and I've worked on the global value chain analysis for their Behind the Brands campaign. Okay. And I think that was actually designed by you. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to know more about how you would link the issues of, let's say, malnutrition and, and achieving better uh, health conditions in countries, how would you use your analysis uh, to achieve that? So one of the things, it's not directly related, but it's very similar, is the project that we've just finished looking at food security in the Middle East and North Africa. And the research question that we had there was what are the linkages between food security, social stability, and how do impacts on the global market play out and, in, and have real consequences for the Middle East and North Africa, which is the most import-dependent country for critical grains in the world. Um, and what we found was, and actually Oxfam was, has promoted this a lot, that five companies across the globe manage between 70 to 90%, depending on how you want to slice it, of all grains that are traded in the world, just five. Um, and so these five, what's interesting about that is it's not necessarily bad on the principle, but their profits are not driven necessarily by grains. And so it is not a crucial for them. And then at the same time, they, so they're very diversified, very big in scope, but at the same time, a lot of the uses that they are using for the grains, for example, corn now going into biofuels, creates these, pipe, these price hikes that make it difficult for importing countries to afford the food to come in, 
which then creates shortages within country, which then can increase the likelihood of social unrest um, or availability of food, which would impact nutrition, nutrition. outcome. That's a great question. Yeah. I, I love the coincidences when we find that we've been working with the same people. Right. It happens, and it only we only find out when we talk with each other in, in this particular way, instead of in our individual silos. So, thank you for the question. Gavin, I have a question. Why do you refer to your work as value chain? It's value chain. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know if you want to try it first, here, Dane, but uh, Can or you yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. So this might be 100% and then I have someone to correct me. So it originally came out of commodity chain research that was established at, well, in the 70s by Wallerstein. And so then it became global commodity chain where you followed a commodity throughout. But then increasingly we realized that, or the researchers at the time realized that that was not the best way to necessarily think about it, that there are a lot of things that aren't commodities that are still global. Actually most products are global. So this was one of the reasons for the idea of the shift to value chain. And then it also emphasizes the importance to trace value creation and value capture at each segment of wherever the product that you're looking at or service touches down. And then the values are beyond the supply chain. So we're not just talking about the, the inputs to the product. We're talking about the soft inputs to the product, design, marketing, advertising, uh, logistics, for example, tends to be a huge thing. I, I remember Mike, uh, when we did work in 2008 for Anthony So on the Plumpy Nut value chain, uh, that, there was a problem there because they couldn't get these RUTFs in the hands of people who were starving. And the problem was, wasn't in the supply chain, it was actually in this whole value chain, and then and they, they just couldn't get it to them. And the problem was that it was getting to the port and then stopping. So where's the other value? You might say that those segments of the chain could be part of the supply as well. We just think that the word value captures better uh, this process of bringing something from conception to delivery and adoption. I'm actually worried that for people in in delivering services, it could be confusing. It could be seen as an economic value, um, well, I, which I, is I, I'm not sure you you often don't. I, I just think it's a term that maybe is more confusing to a wider audience than you think. I, I, I take your point. Uh, that value seems to be linked to monetary value, to economic gain. I don't, I don't know, because I, 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 I've sat through a lot of talks on this and talked to people and they don't quite, you know, what you're doing is an analysis, a very important analysis of why a particular product or entity isn't having the impact it's having and what, why isn't it having it and where are the barriers and what needs to be addressed. And those are all really important. I'm just not sure that the, the term value chain conveys what you do. That's really all I'm saying. I, it's a great point. Um, you know, we, we, we travel from and I'm not suggesting chain. another name. No, I no, no. I, another I, name. I, I, but I just want to give you that feedback because uh, it's, it's not, I can see, that's why I wanted to know where it came from. Because here, you know, understanding now is that it was based on commodity. Sure, then I understand that. But just something to think about. I mean, because I, I mean, I can turn the question another way and say, when do you, what is the most important Delivery that that your analysis usually brings. You know, what do you what what's the most valuable output of your work? So as we look across the chain after we've mapped the actors and the way that Dane described the projects he's involved with, the, the point is of looking at that map of actors and processes is you can't affect the entire chain, but it helps you identify that leverage point, that bottleneck, should it be. Right. where you can actually have an impact. So I, I can't do this, but I can do this. And in doing so, I can have an impact that will, will improve the lives of X many people because of this global health intervention or because of this food delivery issue uh, in manufacturing. It, 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 it actually generates information about hiring more people, uh, attracting more investment. In some of those cases, it, it tends to maybe speak more to the value issue. Might right, so for example, if I want, I'm just gonna talk this morning, if Please. I wanted to increase use of HPV vaccine in Africa. Okay, and there are, you know, with all the cervical cancer that's occurring. Right. You could do, I'm sure, a very interesting analysis that would pinpoint the things that would make the biggest difference in making that happen. Uh, and, okay, I, I just, I, I wouldn't think of that, what wouldn't come to me is the value chain. The value, yeah. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, in a way, I think what you can offer is not as much appreciated as it, as, it, as it could be if the name might be different, I don't know. 
I'm just guessing, Gavin. I don't know whether you think I'm way off on this. No, I agree. Um, about bottleneck analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not a great term either. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been tried. <laughs> We, we actually sat down at a table with a USA person, what, two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, to distinguish for him the difference between bottleneck analysis and GVC analysis. And I'm not sure where we landed on that one. But well, what is the difference? So I, they're very similar. One of the things that when we talk about leverage points, a bottleneck is a leverage point, right? Sure. It's a critical sure. junction. Yeah. But we look at it beyond that to look at other oppor like opportunities and low-hanging fruit that you can grab as well. And then... Um, also, as a little bit of an anecdote, we found that a lot of people get really uncomfortable when you go and say, we're going to talk to you about bottlenecks yeah. that you have, after they've spent 10 years doing something and then you're coming in from the outside, they've never seen you before, it's like, you're <laughs> going to tell me what's wrong with what I've been spending my entire career doing. Um, but when you get about, when we talk about leverage points, people get excited, like, yeah, this is the thing that gives us the trouble, this is the thing that, once we get it right, we really see things speed up, or we see people really getting on board. So that's not Duke specific in a, um, terminology, that's what everyone uses. And is there always a product or a commodity in your analysis? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Because I was just trying to think through, so some of the work that my center is going to be doing, for example, will include trying to understand some of the barriers to funding for global health research, and some of the ways to mobilize more funding for that. And I was just trying to think how you would do a value chain analysis of global health R&D landscape? Could you, or does there have to be, there will be products coming out of the pipeline, but really we're looking at the whole landscape to begin with. Typically there's an industry or a geographic focus to what we're doing. <coughs> uh, often that's one of the first questions we ask at, in this conference call that we just had with Oxfam before I got here. Um, that was on the table. Um, if, if, you, if you look at a value chain and we're looking at R&D or looking at, uh, at logistics, for example, I mean, yeah, there's always going to be a product focus there, but um, we can parse that R&D segment um, down to the infinite level. You just keep looking, looking for that point where you can affect change, essentially. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at the change. We're looking at the chain so that we can identify the point where we can affect change, yeah. uh, change that's beneficial to the, to the end user in this case. So uh, is there, in, in that case, yes, there's processes inside the value chain that we can then look at that very difficult to separate it from the actual product. Yeah. You know, I, I hate this kind of commodity focus, though. I mean, you're, you're really, the, the question is really well put about how, uh, I, I, often when I, when I talk about this, and I'm challenging myself here right now, because you, uh, these are very good questions, I, I talk about a value chain as being the description of a product or a process mm -hmm. from conception to adoption. That's, that's the concise way of looking at what a value chain is. Does that include these soft processes? It does. Um, but you could apply it to, for example, breastfeeding or hand washing or behaviors that clearly are yeah. health learning. I, I think we'd love to work with some of you on, on that. On that, that would that would uh, bring out a question that perhaps has not been asked, that has not been asked, that needs to be asked. That perhaps we could bring some light to. And if Duke researchers want to work with you, how do we do that? Do we have to pay you? <laughs> 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 million dollar question. Yeah, well. Million dollar. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, in Dave's case, the ten dollar question. That's <laughs> all. Oh, yeah. We we are we are looking to partner with people, yeah. but obviously we, we do uh, we have to be funded to put the lights on to what we're doing. So uh, we'd love to work with people as we've begun to work with uh, Joy Noel and the team and trying to think about proposal development that yeah. where our team and its expertise and some of the networks that we bring to the table would bring some value to a potential funder. <laughs> That's the way we'd like to work together. Um, we've had a number of conversations going back to 2008 about trying to find ways that those foundations and NGOs and others that fund work in this area would find some, some attraction to the idea that these social scientists would bring something to bear yeah. on a health question. I think that's, that's pretty much been said. Well, yeah, I think the HPV vaccine one is a fantastic example. Well, yeah, even, uh, even with Joy, I mean, just to put it a little bit, what is the difference between what you do and what Joy would call program evaluation? I mean, I think it's interesting to brainstorm about that. Yeah, I, I think agree. that's where the language does matter, the word does matter. I agree, I agree. Well, so Maybe I'm Joy could comment on that. Yeah, I'm just thinking of an example. So like if you worked, I know you don't work as much in the health sector with USA, but so for example, you know, their population and reproductive health unit, they've been pushing long acting contraceptives for forever. They're evidence-based, they don't need any more evaluation around whether they work or not. 
but the focus is very much on end user and adoption. But maybe there are other leverage points about why it's not you know, getting into the market the way it needs to in Africa or something like that. So like if there were like a top 10 list from USAID Health Sector about these are the things that we know are already evidence-based and could make a real public health impact, we're focusing all our research on why this individual is not picking it up, but maybe there's actually a much broader perspective that needs to be taken on why things are not moving into um, you know, adoption at the individual level. And maybe it's more than just supply chain. I know our sure. USA does a lot of the supply chain stuff, but you know, if there's a bigger picture, and to me, that's what I like about the global value chain is it is a broader perspective and thinking outside of just that end user and just the supply chain, because I think there might be a different lens that you guys are offering. Um, and I think speaking to the issue about the, you know this value issue, maybe indicating more of a commercial uh, uh, component to what we're doing. In fact, what other what what the sponsors that, that we work with in the past find unique about us is that we talk to firms. That's who has this. I'm not saying that other researchers don't, have, but it's a, a kind of a default position for us that you really can't get to the answers that you need to get to unless you talk to the firms. Whereas in the case of, uh, I mean, the firm that, that Dane was talking about with Cordycity and that's creating this bottleneck in, in, in delivering a needed product to a needed population, um, that's, that's the value we bring. We don't, you know, and we'll go, I mean, I, when I was in Kazakhstan last week and uh, the team was making his presentation, Dane has been involved with his work as well, but we're working with a team of researchers on the wheat value chain in Kazakhstan because it matters to Kazakhstan. And in the audience were a number of firms and industry associations, and they were ablaze uh, and really wanting to be involved in the conversation. So part of this is iterative. We keep talking about it, and we keep involving a, a broadening list of, of actors that are involved that's going to bring out some, some beneficial change that will ultimately improve the wheat value chain in Kazakhstan, improve economies in Kazakhstan, employ more workers, improve the quality of the product, uh, improve, improve nutrition down the line. Um, but it only happens if you talk to firms, really. The problem is that global health people are, more, are mostly concerned with delivery, if you want to talk about products, of products to the poorest, and, you know, the, the, and, and are not necessarily concerned about profit or, or value in an economic sense, more than more in a health sense. And I think that's, you know, that, that's where I think the term may not, you know, may be getting in our way a little bit of what you want to do. Because I, I, what I hear you do is very sound, what I would call program management. And you, and you know when there's you problem solve around principles of program management, right? And and you know that's something we sh we should be teach we try to teach our students in courses, right? And so of course you you have a, a framework that obviously you've used over years, and, and so it works well and it's comprehensive, and you you also have hunches so you know where to start and that kind of thing, and so it's very valuable. I'm just thinking the, that how how we can find ways to work together. In a context of a global health uh, environment rather than in a business environment. Not that companies don't matter in global health, they certainly do, uh, particularly when it comes to products and, and vaccines in particular and drugs, right? So, but I think it's an interesting discussion and, and certainly worth, for, I'm glad you're more involved now with us and we should try to find some other opportunities. The chlorhexidine one is an interesting one. I, I knew Jeff was hanging out in Bangladesh. I didn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you know. You know, sometimes, uh, as, as we've talked about this over the last number of years, and we show up at meetings, and I can remember my first meetings that we had in the, in the, the big meeting room there at the Irwin Mill, uh, when right. we first talked talk about making proposals to Kellogg and right. Robert Johnson on the pediatric, pediatric obesity issue. And Gary and I show up, and, and everybody except you was in a white coat. And they're kind of looking at these social scientists. What are you, what are you guys doing here? You know, because we're talking about we're talking about health issues here. Well, excuse me. We, you know, so I mean that that conversation that was not like the first time we had the conversation, but the involvement of this other perspective, albeit a business perspective. Sometimes people look at our work and they say, "Well, aren't you guys in the people school of business?" Yeah, well, that would be the natural thing. Yeah. Just the name would suggest that. Yeah, <laughs> right. perhaps, perhaps so. Perhaps so. I think your those sorts of approaches can be um, really revolutionary. I had, I've had the good fortune to do quite a lot of work with, although now people worry about them. The Clinton Foundation, who have done great work. Um, oh boy, and particularly, you have to testify. I know. Uh, <laughs> with Chai, preach it, preach it, brother. With yeah. Clinton, the election, they're going to call you in. And so they hire a lot of 
folks out of the business world, out of consulting, out of Bain, out of BCG. And so I've done work with them, for example, on scaling up zinc for diarrhea. A lot of that is in the private sector. And so, you know, I would come along to these meetings and you'd had, you have people who are trying to strip down the, the chain, understand the demand side barriers, understand the supply side barriers, understand the profit margins for suppliers. And it is a whole different way of, certainly if you come from a medical or public health background, you never get that. So I, it really was fascinating. Since Gary and his colleague, Gary Jarecki, founder of the framework really, together with colleagues in, in England and elsewhere, since that began in the 90s and through the 2000s, we are now finding that the Baines, yeah. the Boston Consultings, and the McKinsey's, yeah. and the Deloitte's, they all have a global value chain yeah. unit. They're yeah. all doing GVC analysis, yeah. maybe with more of a focus on that value segment, Mike, that you're, you're questioning. Mm -hmm. you know, and we always say yes, but this is who we are. So yeah. the differentiation we bring to the interaction is this, it's you. And the conversation that we're having with people in the academy that we think kind of season and leaven what we're doing that perhaps in the business world they don't do as well. Uh, I mean, we've, whatever it is, we seem to be responding to a need out there because uh, we've been, we've had some lean moments as yeah. all research centers have, but we're kind of in a sweet spot right now with uh, people finding us who are just really wanting to use this framework to help answer their questions. So uh, we hope to continue to do that. If you go back and work on zinc, you know, the delivery is terrible. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. It'll be right for that kind of analysis. Well, let's sit down and talk about writing up a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> on that note. On that note. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.